want to, want to welcome you guys to another edition of Halftime Chat. And today I've got special guest, George Myers Jr., who has been an engineer and a producer with Teddy Riley. And um, it's going to be great just hearing his story. Okay, that's your just connected. Okay, you can hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I, I think it might be Excellent. best if you turn the turn the camera sideways. At least then that would, yeah, goodness, so that we <laughs> get a full screen. Okay, I was trying to get a little backdrop with this. Yeah, no, it gets everything. Yeah, it, it gets yeah, all the... I take the light. So before we start, how are you? It's a pleasure, pleasure meeting you, sir. Yeah, goodness, yeah. It's really, it's really an honor as well to... To be able to uh, to at least see you and 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 then talk to you and stuff. <laughs> My apologies again. The traffic, as you guys say over there, is massive. <laughs> yeah, it's a, no, it's fine. It's, it's understandable sometimes. Okay, it's a new construction they're doing. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, uh, which studio are you in? So I'm in. I'm at Black Label Recording Studio right now. This is uh, my home base. Um, this studio is uh, partly Chauncey's studio. Okay. Um, was constructed when he was doing his uh, solo project wow. um, for him to uh, work on. Yeah, it's a really very, very, very nice studio. Matter of fact, the speakers are English. They're, they're quested. Mm -hmm. So I had to call over there a couple of times, you know, just to touch base and stuff, you know, tech stuff with them and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, as he went on doing his stuff, the studio was here for a while and um, the silent partner decided to open it up uh, semi-private, semi-public because there's a, you know, a big music scene here and there are a few that's very serious about the craft. Okay. Um, you know, that's dealing with labels and so on and so forth. So the place is a very nice place and it's suitable for that type of uh, situation. You know, if you have meetings, people coming in, we have a lounge, this and that, you know, and plus it's a professionally built studio by a company from Canada. So they, they build studios. It's, you know, some people, they have a contractor, local contractor, and they have plans and they, but no, it's a lot of, uh, yeah, stuff went into here. Math, you wow. know, the angling of the speakers and stuff like that. They use lasers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that. I mean, but I mean, yeah. first of all, I mean, it's it's really good to get you onto the show, and and I'm sure some people might be very familiar with you from um, seeing your names in the credits. Although nowadays we we we, we don't get the luxury of CDs to start reading the credits, but. Yeah. In a, in the in the nineties and uh, and stuff when we did have the CDs, a lot of your credits and names would would, would be there. Um, but we'll and we'll get into a lot of the stuff that you've done. But how we always start off, we always because we have an international audience, we always like to get to, to know where you were sort of born and raised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so I was born in Trinidad. The oh, okay. Caribbean island of Trinidad, the twin nation, Trinidad and Tobago, home of the carnival yeah. and the steel fan, right? Um, and I actually, you know, my parents migrated to the U.S. when I was a child. I came there when I was six. Um, but, for you know, I grew up in the Caribbean culture. Okay. There. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain you the whole story. So I grew up in the Caribbean culture there because we grew up in, I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, so, you know, everybody migrates there from the Caribbean when they go to New York and stuff like that. Mm. So my eldest brother, God bless his soul right now, um, he was a DJ on the Caribbean circuit. So, you know, when I was a little lad and stuff like that, I'm out there with him with the boxes and hooking up the amps. And he would take me over by his guy who was um, customizing his amps and customizing his speakers. And then eventually I started spinning records a little bit too, you know, like say he was late, I would have to start his set for him. Nobody knew the difference. You know, they just see this little head behind the thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd be spinning and stuff like that. And then I started got, getting interested in the records and how they were made. Hmm from that point you know and uh we had a friend who was actually my brother's friend 
His name is uh, Ralston Charles um, of Charlie's Records, who did a lot of Caribbean promotion. Uh, he propelled uh, soca music. Okay. Right. Um, very, very instrumental producer. I mean, you name anybody, he uh, did something with them to help their career. Um, very, very instrumental. So he had a studio in Brooklyn, and him and my brother were good friends. Mm. And um, I had attended a school in New York uh, for recording engineering back in the 80s, which was uh, fairly, fairly new. There were actually only two schools that did that before a lot of the universities and stuff like that started having that course. Okay. Um, so it's called Center for Media Arts. And the other one was uh, IAR, Institute of Audio Research. I went to Center for Media Arts. And um, it was a little difficult finding a job oh. then in the profession because it was tight. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and it wasn't a whole lot of studios and everybody, you know, who was into it was into it. Mm. So luckily for me, uh, Ralston Charles had built a very, very, very nice studio in Brooklyn. Um, one that mirrored uh, a studio from Manhattan, you know, with, where the bigger studios was. So my brother had um, gotten me a job there, just really doing anything. So he said, give him a job sweeping the floors, cleaning <laughs> the bathroom. It sounds like one of those stories, but it's true. And um, so when I first started, I wasn't even allowed in the studio. I had to stay out in the lounge. You know, I was what, what you would call a runner. Okay. Which means for those who don't know, when you're sent to the store, you run. <laughs> <laughs> when you're asked to do something, you run. You're a runner. So you run and you come back quickly. <clears throat> so that's what I did. And then um, I would be allowed to be in the room. And then I started assisting. And uh, there's a couple of engineers, uh, my mentors, uh, like Akili Walker, who did a lot of the fat boy stuff and Curtis Blow and Run the MCs. And I got to work with those guys through, through him because those clientele started coming to the studio. And mm -hmm. that's kind of like how I met Teddy, too. I met Teddy at that particular studio when he was at the age of 16. 16? Doing, yeah, doing kids at work. Oh, yeah, with Timmy Gatlin, yes. Yeah, and I was so impressed with him. Oh. You know. Um, no, but what, what was it about a sick... I mean, was that too young to be in the studio? No, his ability at that age to uh, run a session, you know, and... Uh, uh, to produce. Sixteen. <laughs> 16, I think he was 16, 16 or 15. He was young, you know, and um, <laughs> I wasn't even engineering then. I was still like, you know, assisting and stuff like that, you know. So years later, um, another one of the engineers who used to work there with him, he was working with him down here in Virginia. Um. And he wanted to relocate back up to New York. So he had called me up and said, hey, man, do you want to come down here? And you oh, know, was, was that this? Dave way? Oh, no, that was Franklin. Franklin. Franklin Grant. Franklin Grant. Correct. Okay. Correct. Franklin Grant. Right. And so he called me up, you know, and, you know, wanted to fill the slot, you know, with someone ah. reliable. I mean, if you're making a transition, you don't want to be like, hey, man, thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. You know, so it's like, hey, you know this guy? He's just as good, blah, blah, blah. So you don't miss a beat. You know what I mean? Kind of. Mm. So it was a great opportunity for me because at that time, um, uh, my family was still young, you know. And um, here in Virginia is a more conducive environment for raising kids. It's more okay. family oriented. It's mm -hmm. not as fast as New York. Um <clears throat> I wouldn't say they have better schools or better or anything, but they have good. You know, it's I prefer slower. Okay. You know, right. Um, so that was a lot of motivation for me. Well, and, around around what year was this that you that you got the opportunity to move? Right. So it was uh 
91, I believe it was, I came down. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just, but, but when you were in New York and, and at, at the studio in New, in New York, I mean, we, who, what kind of records were you working on then before you, you moved to Teddy? Right. So uh, a variety of stuff. That's where you would, the old saying goes, you know, I cut my teeth. Yeah. Um, it was a beautiful studio, nice live room with stone walls and stuff and a nice grand piano, Yamaha C7, uh, uh, you know, um, still very much close with the owner. He's like a big brother to me, you know, yeah. so I talk to him very often, right? So the stuff that I worked on there is, you know, assisting and engineering some of the people that came through there, as I said, in the early days, uh, oh, Dougie Fresh did the show at six minutes. He did the show at that studio. But was Teddy there? Because Teddy's yes, Teddy had came through there. Yeah, that time to do the too. show. No, with, with yeah, Dougie. that was a little bit prior to me uh, getting there. So I'm okay. not gonna, you know, I don't take credit for stuff that I, I, I haven't been involved in. You know, mm. even though sometimes people make mistakes and affiliate you. You know. Okay. Um. Yeah, so that was done there. and But then I worked with Dougie after that there and Teddy after that, but not on that. Um, I worked with Run DMC there. Um, my most notable and my very, very first plaque that I ever got was for Onyx. Which one, Slam? Yes. Oh, They okay. recorded that there. That was a lot of fun with those guys. And they've stayed true to exactly how they were when I first met them, you know, uh, you know, a little rough around the edges. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what was it like? Cause that, that was a, 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 a national hit when they came in. It was it, great. I mean, that it was going to be. When, a... Yes, you could, you know, jam master Jay brought him in. God bless his soul. Also, um, because he had actually made sure I got my plaque for that. You know, that was my very, very first plaque. Um, uh, he's a beautiful person. Um, you know, these guys, they from New York, from Queens, you know, typical New York cats and stuff like that. <laughs> um, a lot of energy, like exactly how they are <laughs> live. It's how they were in the studio. So originally, you know, there were more members in the group and stuff like that. So what we, you know, nowadays, you know, you'd record one person at a time, but they were a group and they like to record together. So we had the individual mics in the room and they all, you know, fed off of each other's energy and stuff like that so it was raw and it was very nice you know uh great experience you know you can feel the excitement and the energy when stuff like that is happening you know yeah. and also worked with the fat boys curtis blow a lot of the early rap there um jazz stuff uh lenny white don't know if you're familiar with lenny white worked with chick korea big time mm. jazz drummer um marcus miller the bass player mm. uh um, Lester Bowie, he's another jazz guy. Um, you know, a few reggae artists came through there. Uh, and in, in those days, what was your particular role? Because I think some of us who aren't as right. familiar with the behind the scenes stuff will not really understand what the engineer so, does, what the uh, mixing role, engineer does. My role is I evolved from being a runner, which I explained a runner does exactly that. You run for your, on your, your duties. Mm. Um, then when I became an assistant was to, you know, set up the room. If I knew we were going to be doing, you know, of course you're prepped ahead of time, live instruments, live drums or whatever. You have all the drums mic'd. Um, they're all plugged in. They're coming up on the board where the engineer would want it. You know, you're familiar with the engineer, how he likes this stuff, uh, whatever compresses the signal chain. Uh, whatever notes needs to be made. You know, when he's ready to work, he just sits down and work. You do all the prepping, uh, may fine tune the mic angles, tell you, well, you know, as the drummer starts playing, you know, move this one, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, so I got to learn a lot about live recording there. Um, a lot of live horns on the uh, Caribbean music. Mm. Um, um, the Well, we didn't record hot, hot, hot there, but the guy who did the, original his name was arrow from montserrat he also recorded there um for people who are familiar with the caribbean soca music uh sparrow you know the mighty sparrow a few of those kind of guys who are, who are very well known in the caribbean um <clears throat> some gospel it was a nice 
not was, is, is still there. Yeah. It's a nice studio, a variety of stuff, analog, of course, back then, 24 track and mixed to half inch. Yeah, but yeah. what does what is your so when you move from being you know setting up the stuff because most of us would see images of somebody in a studio and all these sort of knobs and and stuff like that and but we we then sometimes don't see we see the producer doing that or sometimes we see somebody beside them doing it. What was the role that you had when you moved up from being the runner to and uh, um, from assistant as well? Right. So at times, uh, you know, as you progress, I was allowed to do recordings and stuff like that under the supervision of the engineer he'd sit next to me or whatever, or if it was a situation where I had to do it and he had confidence in me at the time, you know, that's how you evolve. Mm -hmm. Um, But the primary role of the assistant is to, you know, you prep and basically stay ahead of the session. You know, like for instance, you know, you're doing overdubs and the guy's coming in to do guitar. You know, you don't wait till he walks in the room to pull out the DI box and the cables that you're going to be using. You have all of that out. Mm. Or if you, you know, like the best thing to do is to be nosy from a <laughs> distance, which means you have your ears open and you're paying attention to what's going on. You know, your head may be down looking at something, but you hear the guy saying, oh, you know, man, It'd be great if I do this and that and that. And before he can ask you, you get up and you go get the cable or you go set up the mic and say, sure, I'm ready for you. You know, you stay ahead of what's happening by anticipating what's going to be happening. You you know, you know, the engineer is going to be mixing. You have all the half inch tapes or whatever the medium is that you're going to mix down to from the multi-track to your two track uh, um, source. You know, so it's staying ahead of the game and you're responsible for executing what the engineer tells you to do. Because he'll tell you the mic selection, what to put on the kick, what to put on the snare. And he'll tell you uh, what to use on the trumpet, what he wants on the trombone and um, the distance, the working distance of the microphone that he wants to use. Uh, Sometimes like, you know, I learned a lot of different micing techniques. some flat mic they call PZMs that you stick on the wall when you're doing like say piano or the live sound catches the sound that's bouncing off in the room that you would add in as live you know ambience mm. during the recording yeah, yeah. so the, the system is to stay ahead I mean and then what about in those early days still when you before you moved to Virginia seeing a lot of these people you mentioned Run DMC DM um, Dougie Fresh and and those who are passing through yeah. When do you stop becoming starstruck and then just focus on the work? Well, hmm. I'm sorry for pausing, but I really want to answer <laughs> that question the right way. I don't want to offend nobody, but I've never been starstruck with nobody except for one person, and that was Bruce Wadeen. <laughs> yeah, and I told Michael that I said, Michael, no disrespect to you, but I'm more excited about working with Bruce than you. And he laughed. And it's true. I'm a very honest person, right? And it's because of my understanding of life and human beings. I don't put any one particular person on a pedestal. And I don't want to get into those kind of conversations because we have fans that are really big fans of people. Mm. But I. I appreciate and admire, admire uh, the next man's skills. Mm. Not just who he is, but his skills and what he he brings. Yeah, that's what I admire. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when I spoke with John Marie, he, he said the same thing, that he was more really? excited to see Bruce Fedeen than Michael. And yeah. he, you know, he was like, he saw Michael Jackson, so he was freaking that. out, but he said... Wow, this is Brucey Dean. People have, you know, said it when I went. <laughs> yeah, so Uncle Brucey. Yeah, Let's so John Reese said the same thing. There was just the the legacy. I mean, I he mean, studied. <laughs> I mean, so we're engineer. Michael is Michael. Hey, we love you, Michael. But yeah. hey, you didn't record Sarah Vaughan and Duke Ellis. <laughs> well, you know, he said the same thing. All the Quincy Jones stuff. The the legacy yeah, of what Bruce did. Yeah. I'm sorry, we can never do that because. You know, these cats aren't around no more. You know what I mean? 
You know, I'll tell you a Bruce McGinn story whenever we get to that part. You don't know, but it was, man, God bless yeah. him. So, well, no, you, you might as well go because I don't want to forget that. I well, mean. <laughs> so what, when we were, yeah, it was, which I think it was Blood on the Dance Floor or something like that. One of the projects, we were up in New York, I think at the Hit Factory or something like that. And Uncle Brucey, that's what I call him, is Uncle <laughs> Brucey or the Grandmaster. <laughs> my other name for him, the Grandmaster. Um, he used to travel with uh, his uh, collection of microphones. Wow. He had over 100 and something microphones in this uh, big black traveling case. And, you know, he's big and around like Santa Claus. He kind of reminded me of Santa <laughs> Claus, right? The way how you talk or stuff like that. And then he pulled out his one, uh, my, I, I'm not going to lie, I forgot what, what it was. I think it was maybe an 87 or 67 or 47. And he said, I recorded Sarah Vaughn on this mic. And, and I was like, wow, can I just <laughs> touch it? <laughs> you know? My goodness. Like, oh, I, I can't even begin to express how that was. People don't understand, you know, but it's like being connected to history, you know, like. Wow. Because I, I, I can't go back in time to be amongst those people and be in their era, yeah. but he was the connection to that era um, coming into this era of recording, you know, so learned a lot from him, you know, had a lot of good conversations and stuff, you know, you can't be foolish when you're around people like that. Um, what, what, what is it? Because uh, apart from the fact that he was Quincy's and, and Michael's sort of uh, engineer, what was he, did he bring to the table that's different? Because we know that he was associated with these great people, but well, he must have brought something it's extra to it. Skill. Like, I, that's how I can surmise it, his engineering skills. Uh, there's, I don't know the name of it, but the, uh, they're the big tubes that people use in recordings now in the live rooms. Uh, they position them around the person he, he, he came up with that. He invented that. I remember when he was working on that. It uh, controls the, the liveness of the room, the ambience. Like, say you're mm. doing live guitar, and the distance that you move it, the circle around there, they're like cones, mm. um, will uh, dictate the amount of ambience that's being recorded and stuff like that. Um, things like that. He had a good relationship with uh, a lot of the manufacturers, like Sony and stuff like that. Wow. They were, uh, send him well this is during the brief time when we worked together and stuff like that uh equipment to test out like new digital recorders uh wow. this and that blah 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 um his techniques for recording was incredible because when he recorded a song it almost sounded like it was done. And it's just the rough track. Sometimes with, you know, you, you're just putting up the tracks with no effects or no nothing because of the quality of recording. Mm. You know, it was very little to do after. You know, and if you heard something, it was probably intentional. Like he did also um, the Quincy Jones Back on the Block album, oh, which yeah, is yeah. my all-time favorite album in the world because of the variety of recording techniques. Mm. You know, you go from Birdland to this to that. And, uh, uh, you know, because you're in a dead, dry space and you're re -rec re -re -re recreating a live club or whatever, you know, and the accuracy of that to make you feel like you're there sitting in the room, you know? That was yeah. his touch. Yeah. So, so it's and, 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 yeah, and it's amazing that you said that as much as, you know, Michael was Michael, he was more, he was the one you were more excited about. What was mm -hmm. it like? Because everyone else has given me that. How was it like for you then meeting Michael? Because you must have grown up with the Jackson 5 and, and stuff. I did. And we spoke about that too, you know, um, when I got comfortable enough, of course, you know, you don't <laughs> overstep your boundaries. But, you know, so work is work. That's what I say. Work is work. So I'll go back a little bit. So when I came down here and um, <clears throat> I was here on a little trial period, of course, you know, to make sure everything's going to work out. 
and we had that sit down. Well, so how do you feel about staying and bringing the family down and this and that, right? I was like, very excited. It would be great. He says, well, how do you feel about like working with people like, you know, Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown and Michael Jackson, you know? And now I don't want to sound arrogant, <laughs> but this is exactly what I said to him. And I said, no disrespect to you. Ted or none of those other people that you just named, but it's either one out of two things when you come here. It's either you can sing or you can't sing. This is no in between. So who they are and what they mean to the public means nothing, and that's what makes a great engineer because you you it's it's and then too these kind of people respect you more because you're not geeking over them because they're in a work environment. They want to let their hair down and be themselves and not feel like they're being scrutinized still by fans. You, you're so, I like a better word, is the constituents. Mm. You, you know, you're helping to get the job done at the time. Mm. You know, you can't be like, wow, wow, you know. Yeah. Except one time, you know, and I'll tell the story when I was home, uh, during one of the recordings, I think the Vince Baldwin, Michael had called me on my cell phone <laughs> to talk to me about something, right? And I was home sitting in the couch <laughs> when I heard it was him. For some reason, I automatically jumped up and stood up to take the call. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> I, I remember that part too. You know? It was great. You know, he, it was, it was, um, that's actually, you know, I'm not going to lie, the high point of my career working with Michael uh, as well as with Ted. Ted was the high point, but Let's just say he was the cherry on the top. What, what did you do with Michael then? What 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 were the songs that you you can remember doing? So on the Invincible album, well, the first you know, time we did, the, we did the Blood on the Dance Floor. I was not there for the Remember the Times. Initially, I came in like after, um, so I'm not accredited on it like that. Um, uh. What else did we do? Um, something else for another movie. That was it did. one for the the Adams Family Value? The Adams Family. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't want to say the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. exactly what popped into my mind. That the Invincible album was the 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 uh, the most lengthiest stuff that we did with, that I did with him. You know, Ted did a whole lot of other stuff, but as far as me being involved, yeah. the Invincible album was uh, more so. You know, um, prior to that was. Um, you know, individual songs and stuff like that, you yeah. know? But so, with the Invincible yeah. album, I was surprised because I know that um, Rodney um, did, a, did did about half the songs. And so mm -hmm. were you guys brought on after the song uh, later on um, to do some those like um, Heaven Can Wait, um, Break of Dawn, I believe it was um, 2000 Watts. I think mm -hmm. it was... Um, yes, um what, what whatever happens whatever happens yeah <laughs> so i don't know about the politics of who came first and who came second but i do know that ted started the album right um ted was always uh Michael's go-to guy, I would say after Quincy, right? Like how Quincy was his go-to guy and anybody mm -hmm. else was in addition to Quincy. So, you know, from the Remember the Time stuff and so on with Jamming in the Closet, Teddy became his go-to guy and it was anybody else in addition to, right? So, yeah. So, but we all did the album together, but um our camp set the tone for the album and i'll explain what i mean by that so bruce was the head engineer in charge of everything um the recordings were done and then you would uh submit like a dat which is a digital audio tape of small uh had one around here i thought i had one right around where my hand is <laughs> a small little tape ah see popped it right out of the tape machine look at that 
Look, oh, oh, oh. Down this way. This is a dot. What's written on it? This is a dot, and it says D A T. Where am I? Right there. Yeah, yeah, and it looks okay. like one of those um, handy cam eight uh, videotapes. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, whatever work you did during the day, you know, you do your rough mixes and you submit it to Bruce and him and Michael would review it and so on and so forth. And especially when it came to the mixing, you know, everybody did their own mixing and stuff like that. But Bruce had the final say mm. in uh, everything. You know, he was in charge of quality control, okay. you know, because he's <laughs> Michael's go-to guy. So mm. we were all felt under that umbrella and that, that structure but yeah it was great you know we were down in miami we were here in virginia we were in new york uh we did a lot of recording on the bus teddy had the tour bus with the studio in the back of it one of one of the first you know we pioneered a lot of stuff that people do today um that people don't know about you know Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, what was the first song you, you can remember doing them? Was it um with Teddy? No, no, with, with on the Invisible album. Oh boy, no, that one I don't know what the first one was that we started recording. Because uh I'll tell you, um as I say, work is work, you know, so it didn't matter what it was or who it was or who it was for, is just um <clears throat> maintaining the standard. Mm. Um, of you know what we had going on, um, yeah. so I don't remember the very first one, but you know I remember you know a lot a lot of the songs with uh, Richard Stite. He came in from California with Heaven Can Wait and Whatever Happens and so on and so forth. Um, okay, yeah. so did did them? Does Michael come in to Virginia to record oh, the vocals? Yes. That was a total mess when he came. <laughs> oh my goodness. The helicopters, the new <laughs> people. Because so um let me describe how the studio was, which coincidentally was right next door to Princess Anne, where Pharrell went to school, and Pharrell used to walk over after school and come to the studio. Okay. Um, him and Chad. So Virginia Beach Boulevard, big ma major street, and you know you turn into the car park, and then it's the big um, parking lot, and then it's the big standalone building, and it had a little body of water, and you know a little lawn, uh, just by where the water was on the other side of the parking lot. So people would camp out over there, like <laughs> tents, and we, of course, we always had security. Yeah. You know, at the studio and stuff like that, but we had to have extra in with Michael's guys, and then the group <laughs> reporters was there, and the helicopters used to be flying overhead. So the way how the studio was set up, um, you know, of course you had the big main, the main entrance, but we had uh, like a service doors, which were like big double doors, like if you had to bring in big stuff, you know, yeah. for the board and all of that, that we open up, and that opened up into a certain part. So we had that. And we had a tent, like protruded out into the parking lot where his vehicle would pull in and you couldn't <laughs> see. So he'd come out through the double doors and go into the vehicle. But then what we had to do was have like three or four vehicles because people with the news would want to follow them. Wow. So you couldn't tell which one he was in. And then they would line up and everybody go in different directions. <laughs> <laughs> wow well, scene out of a movie <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and the helicopters and the this and the that and you know and it was fun <laughs> it was fun it was fun and then you know i'll tell you about michael he was very loyal to his fans because he would go out and talk to some of them he's like i gotta go out and talk to such and such you know they was in Holland with me or this. And I'm like, wow, these people used to follow him around the world. <laughs> you know, so he had to go talk to them. Some of them he even knew by names and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, very intelligent guy. Remembered a lot of stuff, yeah. Wow. Well, from that Invisible album, what was your favorite track on that album that you worked on? Um, <clears throat> hands down, Break It Dawn. Okay. Um, Break It Dawn enjoyed working on that enjoyed um mixing 
that like <clears throat> you know like i was saying like even down to like the little radio voice thing that uh, uh, i did with his voice you know that's something that catches into now but that's something we did way back then mm. you know a lot of recording techniques you know ending the song with uh with the acapella voices you know cutting out the music listen to some of the black street music um uh, going to mastering with uh pro tools rig uh, we started doing that back then we'd take a whole because we would <clears throat> create stems uh, everybody uses that word now and they you know i don't want to sound too tutorial but they use the word incorrectly because stems was the parts you would send to people for the movies mm. send them stems They'd like the drums and the the, the 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 effects and the this and everything separated in stems but that applied now and translated to how we used to print the tracks, like a stereo drum, stereo keys, and mm. you know, stereo backgrounds. So now, when you go to mastering, whatever needed to be done, you can without going back to the studio. Mm. You know, as a matter of fact, we had like the actual whole session if we had to pull it up. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, the hard drive, like a whole rig, a whole Pro Tools rig so if the mm. mastering cat said well, mm, i wish i had a little bit more lead okay so just turn up the lead because <laughs> <laughs> he's there by himself printed yeah. with all the effects and everything so collectively when you hear it hear it you're hearing the mix mm. but then you have the individual components yeah that you can, yeah master yeah from way back then in the 90s i mean just one more question around that album what about 2000 Watts? Because it seemed his voice was different on, on that track. He almost like he was a famous. So <laughs> I'm brutally, brutally honest. I know Teddy will probably see this, but that's the one song that I did not like. And because of exactly what you just alluded to. Um, hmm. So I didn't like the production on it and how it came out um, because I didn't think that was Michael and it's not so much the song or the lyrical content or anything like that but let's just say how it turned out I didn't like how it sounded you know mm -hmm. it was something different that we were you know he's going for but just me personally I didn't like it you know yeah his voice was very different almost very yeah, deep uh, yeah. so I'm did... not getting into it <laughs> yeah, but were you recording him singing the track? I'm sorry, lost you? No, were you, were you recording Michael actually singing those the track? Because it didn't sound like him. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Recorded all of, yeah, we recorded all of those vocals and stuff like that, so. And, and he didn't seem to mind having a sort of the deeper voice, bass line, you know, because it just, it just seemed very different. He didn't mind it. Right. That's what I was uh, alluding to, that mm -hmm. I just didn't like uh, the process of that particular recording and how it came out without getting into what was done. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't like the final outcome because I thought it didn't really sound Michael-ish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. And a, a lot of fans from stuff I've read, they've commented and shared the same sentiment. Mm. So, and, you know, if it's raining, you're going to get what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we, we could pass it on, Michael. So, coming back to, you made a decision with your family to move to Virginia around 91. Um, what was the first thing that you, you, you started working on when you arrived? And this I will not forget. And God bless the brother, Heavy D. Okay. I forgot the name of the song. But I remember, and I'm not even going to lie about this particular story. So Ted had an SSL. And I uh, what's had, an SSL just first? Oh, <laughs> right. So there's um, various types of consoles. Okay, um, like a, okay, the, let the consoles The, the look big like. board with all the yeah. faders and the knobs and stuff like that. Okay. So there are particular kinds of boards that um, have like, 
uh, what we would call signature sounds to it. When the music is all set and then and processed through it because of the electronics, um, it kind of gives it a distinct kind of sound. So mm. I came from Neve consoles, which is English, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I transitioned to Ted and he had the SSL and I wasn't um, fluid on the SSL as far as operations, you know, engineering is engineering, right? And I was cutting some vocals with, with Heavy D and I was trying to do something. And then Heavy D came over and was like, you need some help, man? He started pushing the buttons too. And it's like, maybe it's this one, maybe it's that one. Wow. And I'm sitting there going, man, I gotta get my shit together before <laughs> this man walks in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, so, Heavy ended up help, helping me um, figure out a little bit about the routing on the board and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, cool. And so, then I started flying after that. So that was 91. And um, he did the Peaceful Journey album then. That was so it would have, um, it's, um, yeah. is it good to you? And um, um, now that we found love. Yeah. It wasn't now that we found love or those. I can't remember the song, but I know it wasn't those. But it was around that era and that time frame. Yeah. Oh, oh um, was it when he did the remix for Mary J, which is um, um my the, um, the remix. So now that I found, uh, he did um, not he he did a re because yeah he did the remix for Mary. Um, yeah. And, and around the what's the four one one remix, and that was um, yeah. um my love. Yes. With, with, that might have been it. Okay. That might have been it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, it, so as I, well, the fans didn't know our, with our private conversation, but it was such a large volume of work. Um, didn't have time to differentiate what really was being, well, who was being done, who the artist was. It was really what it was. It's like, you know, so how Ted would work, you know, he programmed the music, had his, you know, mm -hmm. nice setup with the keyboards and the racks and the da, 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 da. And he'd program and then it's up to the engineers to record the tracks and stuff like that and get it down because he's on to the next thing, either to get some rest or in the next room, you know what I mean, to keep the work going. So we had our standards of how we re record stuff and catalog stuff and, and so on and so forth. So, and then uh, various artists would come in and that's sometimes, you know, you'd remember, oh yeah, this is their song because you got to pull it up because they're here to do vocals, you know oh, what I mean? Okay, okay. And okay. we do the vocals, we be hospitable, entertain them, laugh, joke, you know, all the same stuff. And, you know, like a doctor's office. Next patient. <laughs> so, so, I mean, as for us who are fans of New Jack, I'll tell you, we know that, there was your name. There was John Marie. There was is it Sir, yeah, Sabre, that's my brother. A Sabrin or Seben or Seben. Serban. Serban. So yes. were the three of you all working at, together or separately? Or how does at that? One particular time, John was here with us because John actually started before me, too, and um, he you know went back to the West Coast and so on and so forth. So how? The studio was operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. All right. With granted little Christmas here and there <laughs> and so on and so forth. You get time for a hot meal, you know, the work <laughs> that you eat. So um, we do like shifts. Okay. You know, that's what I'm saying. We are, um, but I was there, I would say, primarily the longest and so on and so forth. And, you know, I would have been what you would have called the chief engineer at the time. Um, so we had a certain protocol and standard and where we operated, did things, uh, how we recorded. So either I would start something, the next guy, we hand the ball off to each other. You know, we were very much in tune with each other because we had a standard of recording that we we followed, you know, with our levels, without this, without that, right? To in order to in our uh, meticulous note keeping about what's going on. So even if the other engineer wasn't there, I can pull out my notes and read and know exactly what's going on. Mm. And you know, you you flow, 
you know, and the work just kept going and going because Ted is a guy that hardly slept. <laughs> wow. So, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it really took three engineers to keep up with him. Like, <laughs> one, one person ain't doing it. You, you know, you ain't going to do it. Not one. It took like three of us. So you can at least have a little sense of normality, too. So you could go home and get a little sleep and, uh, you know, have time to run and errands, you know, during the day, go pay your bills or whatever that normal people do. Wow. And back to the lab. So we'd rotate, you know, from the morning to the evening, evening to the night, and then from the night back into the morning. The next morning, guy would come in. And there were times when I was the only engineer there, and I still had to keep that schedule. You know, like I didn't even go home except to, you know, take a shower, roll around in my bed so I can say I was in my bed and then go <laughs> right back to the studio. Wow. 18, 20 hour days, you know, you sleep at the studio. We had a shower there and sleep in accommodations, a uh, uh, little kitchen area and stuff like that. So it's home away from home. You know, you don't really feel it. And then it was like a family environment, you know, with okay. everyone. So it was like all brothers and sisters and stuff like that, you know, for real, you know. And um, we call ourselves the future family because we all still keep in touch with each other. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know that when I spoke with uh, Mucho, he he mentioned, um, and even even Rodney, he said it 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 was a lot of work. I mean, there was a lot of volume of p- production that came in, so they had Studio yeah. A, Studio B, and everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it was a, a constant flow because he was one of the hottest producers, so everybody was calling him and he kept coming up with the goods i mean i actually felt fortunate to witness the birth of some of these uh songs and stuff like from the inception or the concept or from the first chord you know working it out mm. the head into the side you know, getting the idea together and then, okay, I got it. And then, and I'll be like, wow. And then, you know, when it's hot, when it ain't even no vocals on it and it's blasting and everybody walking in the room dancing, you know what it is already. <laughs> <laughs> you already know it's special, you know? Yeah. yeah. W- were you there for the Bobby album? The Bobby with. I was there after that with some of uh, the cleaning up stuff or remixes and stuff like that. But I did meet Bobby. I didn't meet Whitney, but we did some stuff for her. God bless her also. Okay, Uh, step by step, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And the little story with that one, too, with Clive Davis, um, which I, you know, got to respect the man. So we had did the mix and then he had called back with a request because uh, back then in those days, you know, it's not like now with Pro Tools, you just load up the computer. You had to physically patch and bring back up. It it took like about a half an hour to put up a song. Hmm. And he wanted, I think, one line turned up by a few DBs at that time. (laughs) How did he know that? How did he know? That's what I said. I was like, man what is this guy talking about <laughs> blah 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 but after we did it and we did what he asked i was like never again i was like i hear the difference wow i did you know it was like a little diction thing or something like that you know or something but after you did it you was like yeah yeah it was a good call <laughs> did he call himself or did somebody else call and say this is what Clive oh, wants? He, he'd call. He called and talked to us and stuff like that. I mean, everybody spoke directly to Teddy or to us. Um yeah, no middleman involved. You know. No, he, I just he, it's amazing that he, he, he unless he you know that he would know specifically what he wanted and, and, and you can then recognize that well what he did request actually did make it make a difference. Yes, yes, it did. Much respect to him. I mean, golden ears, yes. Yeah, and so the um, how is Teddy as as a engineer or or and a mixer? Come, huh? So Teddy loves to engineer. 
<laughs> oh god and i know john marie probably said the same thing too but if you have an engineer let the engineer engineer because <laughs> i'm not going there to play no tracks and program no drums you know it's like, so what am i here for then you know because he likes the engineer and he's fully capable of engineering you know so you know jack of all trades so you really had to be on your game to the point where, you know, it wasn't necessary for him to do anything unless he felt like having some fun doing, you know, flying the plane. Let me fly the plane. You know what I mean? Instead of wow. sitting in the back. So, yeah. And with that said, as an engineer, you really, really had to be on top of your game because it's, there's no pulling no wool over the man's eyes because he's, Knows just as much as you, or maybe a little bit more, you know. That, that was something that John Marie did say that he was probably one of the best engineers he's ever known. I'm going to say the same thing that John Marie said because we're not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> truth is the truth. If it's raining, you're going to get wet. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've learned stuff from him, you know. Is that usual yeah. for producers to be that good in the engineering? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's rare. Rare. And and I think because he was very much interested in the quality of his music, what what uh, drove him to uh, pursue that aspect of recording, other mm-hmm. than just sitting behind the keyboards and leaving it up to the engineer. Now I'm going to sit next to you and make sure you don't mess up what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the things that we did notice was the the the, the sound. So when he from the time he did the Bobby album, the Black Street album, um, even even the remixes for SWV, mm-hmm. and um, and and another level. But then by the time they got to the finally album, the the sound the the sound changed. It didn't sound the same. Does 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 that happen over time, or is it you know? Did you somebody mention? I don't know who. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was John that the he changed the 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 council the board. The and board. I, and and, I, and yeah. I had an effect. I on wish some. you hadn't said that. I was going to tell you, and then you would say John Marie said the same thing. You know, okay, so good. <laughs> it goes back to what I was saying about consoles. Mm. They have signature sounds. Mm. And we had changed the SSL board to another particular board. And therefore, the sound changed mm. also. Not the production or whatever uh, drum sounds or whatever. So it's the electronics that's inside of these mm. guys. It's, what's, it's the engine under the hood, you know? Um, but we got great sounds. I mean, so... Michael's stuff was mixed on that board too, you know, which is the Euphonics. And um, that sounded great. So it sounded different, but it didn't sound bad or worse or anything. You can just notice a different sound, you know what I mean? Because a cook can cook in any pot. You're supposed to be able to cook in any pot. Yeah, but I think as a... F- so most of us who follow Teddy's music from the 80s would, would have known the sounds that he had when he was working right. with Dave Wade, there's the yes. kissing game and, um, yes, yes. um, and you know, now all those, we, there's this, there's this, and there's also this. Too, you said some of those stuff as you were talking about the progression. And this is very interesting too, for young people. When we started progressing from analog to digital, hmm. you can tell the difference in the sound in the sound too. Um, I won't solely point it in the direction of the console, mm. but um, back then Pro Tools wasn't as good. The converters and so on and so forth, the electronics, you know, the the, the hardware under the hood as it is now. So that kind of changed the sound a little bit, mm. you know, um, for whatever it's worth. Okay. Yeah. But yes, the sound did start evolving. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned that uh, Pharrell and Chad um, 
they were just um, next door. I remember speaking to Levi Little, and he used to say how uh, Chad would come with, you know, an oboe and a, and a trumpet and a violin. He just said, <laughs> how was it? When you saw these young kids coming in, did you know that they had something special back yeah. in the Yeah. You can tell, man. You can tell when somebody has something special. Both of them were, were special. Chad, 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 Chad. I remember Chad um, playing on uh, Tonight's the Night. Oh, yeah. I love that song with, with Tammy Lucas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he just came in and just knocked it out of the park right away. My goodness. Uh, he went in there and he did it within like, uh, let me see. Woo, I don't know. He did one take and then he did a second take and then that was it. Wow. And that was the uh, the, the trumpet solo. Excuse me. I'm sorry if I went black there for a minute. <laughs> That's right. Send a text to somebody who keeps harassing me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yes. I have to remind them about my call. <laughs> okay. So he said, "Okay, yeah. So yeah, we 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 were we did see his name on do um, on 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 that production, but I, it was amazing that 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 and when there were still kids when they we were working on that on, on that track. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were um they were still young at that time, pretty much so. Um, yeah, they were still in high school at that time. I want to believe." Wow. Yeah, I believe they were still in high school at that time. Yeah, because they would come over after school, and that's when Teddy had the talent show. Okay. Um, <laughs> they had one of the talent shows, so they, you know, that was part of the deal. They get to come to the studio and, hey, <laughs> look at us now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at that. How about, yeah. you know, one of my favorites, uh, and a lot of us, we, we all love Tammy Lucas. Vocally, how, yeah. how, how would you, uh, recording her vocals, what would you say about uh so easy so sweet effortless you know what i mean um that's when you get great recordings when you gotta do nothing hmm. it, it sounds funny but the more you do is the, the the worse it comes out you know <laughs> but yeah like recording her you just put the mic her voice was so sweet and sultry and airy no it was is you know yeah uh yeah so tammy woo, yeah <laughs> very nice voice very nice voice yeah and do you remember were you working on the first black street album or did you come from a london level did you start with the first one no i started with the very very first one with stone street i met stone street oh yes yeah. yes 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 yeah, before dave was in the group before david now when i levi told me that you, you guys recorded come close to 30 or 40 songs and then but then yeah. when Joe was taken off, they had to re-record with Dave. Yeah. What, what, what was the difference vocally with Joe Stone Street when you when you record when he was there? So Joe Stone Street, he was amazing. You know, I mean, it's kind of cat. You just once again you put the mic on and you just let him go. Uh just does all these kind of different incredible runs and stuff like that. Just like Dave, you know, it's like, um, you know, they learn the material, <clears throat> then perfect it, then, you know, what you would call own it, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you, 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 you sing from the heart and, and, and feeling and the emotion because you, you know, lived with it. And then you put your own personal feel on it, you know, Especially like in the endings of the song, that's not something somebody could tell you what to sing. Mm. The ad stuff like that. That's all the individual. What you're feeling at the time, the vibe, the mood that's created, um, comes out in the recording. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the um, did did you did you still have all the demos they made? Because no, no one seems to seems to have an idea of where the thirty plus demos where they. I'm gonna pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pass on that one there. 
<laughs> that is not a, yeah i'm gonna pass on that one so but to answer your question with your question i'm gonna talk like how i speak to my kids what was the question again do i <laughs> do i do i any idea of how anyone can get a hold of those the demos that never got released on the album to answer your question yes <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I do know how you can get a hold of it. Okay. You got parlez-vous français. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, the little guy that lives in France. That's all I'm going to say right about now. Parlez-vous français, and you okay. go get it. And when you talk to him, you let me talk to him too. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We'll, 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 we'll follow up on that. And so you do the black Swam. Did you did you think the guys were it it will they were going to be because there was a lot of competition oh, yeah. back in oh, those no, days. No, no, no. I knew exactly what was about to happen. Everything was intentional. They knew exactly what was about to happen. All the noise was about to make. Yeah, mm. they knew exactly what we were doing. Exactly what we were doing. It wasn't no mistake. Yeah, that those things aren't flukes. I mean, exactly. When I say exactly, exactly. Yeah, we learned a lot working with Teddy. Yeah, because he knew exactly what he was doing. I'm not gonna lie; he knew exactly what he was doing. I can't even say no better. He knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> but, but you know, you guys had a. I think as fans, some of us were we, we thought that because um, we enjoyed those '80s and '90s when he left Guy. And he was just producing a lot of stuff. But yeah. then when he joined Blackstreet and they were touring, it in a way, the, the, did it seem like the work kind of slowed down a little because he wasn't there to, 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 to keep it up? Could it, you mean like with other artists outside of the group? Yeah, because he's if he's not if he's if he's actually part of a group and he's touring uh, the world, then not true. Okay. Because uh, he, <laughs> dude, never slept, man. You know, like I said, we had the studio on the bus. I mean, I don't even know a time when we wasn't working on somebody's stuff. You mm -hmm. know, regardless of where we were, you know, uh, it didn't matter what state, what part of the world, we always had our the tools necessary to do what we had to do whether it was the bus you know because even that one time he brought the tour bus over there i don't know if you remember that yeah, i knew that he had the tour bus and, and that was very new to have a, a, a studio at the back uh, uh, that's because the studio was on the bus it wasn't because he needed the vehicle to get around you could have gotten a vehicle over there it's because the studio the tools need to be constantly with you so you can constantly work you know you, you, you go to sleep right there you get up walk a few feet mm. get back to work as we're driving mm. down the road i mean we we're going down the highway and well we wouldn't cut vocals but i remember mixing and driving <laughs> wow yeah it was great it was great you know we had the little baby you find so whatever it would translate from the bus to the studio I mean, Break of Dawn was partially mixed on the bus and on the SSL and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. Wow. So, and did, some of the other stuff. Yeah. Did, did, did you remember working on the, um, could I spell with Sprague, the Rolling Stones Love is Strong remix? Yes. That was nice. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That was, that was, that was very interesting. Very interesting um, because those guys are iconic, you know. Yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. So uh, certain uh, things when you're working on it, you're like, look, I can't mess this up. You know what I mean? It's um, it's it's respect to them. It has nothing to do with well, people think I'm a shitty engineer or whatever. It's like I can't do this to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're so huge. You you have to maintain their integrity that they have established as an artist and how they sound and how they're perceived, you know? So, yeah, it was, it was very great. With that, did, did they re-record some vocals or did you just use their original vocals? Um, it was just their original vocals that they sent to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we worked with Fine Young Cannibals from over across the pond. Yeah. They actually 
came to the studio and spent time with us and you know became part of the family while we were here wow you yeah. don't have a choice you're going to become part of the family <laughs> well, i mean I, nobody cared about who you are hey how you doing you know you here you here you how, know how was Patty bell when she came well, wonderful that was that's auntie i mean we took her to the grocery store she went shopping came back cook for us she is everything like they said kicked her shoes off <laughs> yeah i mean that's how it is because you see the environment uh translates in the recording i can't stress that enough so when you have that stiff environment you know it's not a suit and tie environment you know mm -hmm. what i mean so You have to be relaxed and it's like I'm here and what do you need me to do and let's have fun and you know if I go burp excuse me you know <laughs> so you feel comfortable to do that you know you're a superstar and you 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 accidentally you know or you know you got to take your shoes off you know most <laughs> people don't do that you know <laughs> make yourself comfortable I'm tired where can I lie down you know mm. yeah So uh, Angela Winbush was nice also, too. Uh, worked with Cheryl Lynn. Yeah, okay. I heard of it. Yeah, she was excellent. Incredible singer. I think five octaves she has, or four octaves. Incredible. Yeah. What was it like then with um, working on with Guy? Because by the time you joined, they were broken up. But we all know that around 94 or something like that, they came back with the New York on the cover all song. Um, all I can tell say, me what you like. one word comes to mind. Fun. Never laughed so hard in my life. Was it Fun. Aaron and, and Damien? What? Fun. Fun, fun, fun working with Aaron. And learned about dogs being around Aaron. Aaron yeah. got me interested in dogs. He's, uh, I don't know, the original dog whisperer, man. Up yeah. To I think yesterday I was talking about him and I don't know how he does it, but like they actually like, I don't know, but I don't know, but he's incredible with them. They do exactly what they're told in whatever language he says it in um, and down to little puppies, you know, because so we were in Trinidad working on some of the guy stuff one time because we went down there to do some of the Black Street album. I think it was the second album too. And somebody gave Aaron a Rockwilder puppy as a gift. And the puppy was only a few weeks old. And we were all amazed that the puppy would follow him around. He could call the puppy, whatever, try to distract the puppy, wouldn't leave his side. He's got that gift. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I think he was, um, yeah, he's still running the, his, that, the business out in Los Angeles. And uh, I think that's put his singing on hold. Because that's, well, that's his love. His primary love is the dogs. You know, that's he like absolutely loves dogs. His house, I think, remember hearing him. He's got like 30, 30 dogs in the house. The house belongs to the dogs. And when you come there, you've got this big dog going to sit in your lap. And <laughs> one of the very dangerous dogs, like Presser Canaries, and you know, like dogs that'll take your head off. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, um, Gosh, can we do this in two parts also? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, um, that's fine. Because I have some people here. I'm at the studio. Okay. And kind of antsy to get in. And I know yeah. you want to start. I can wear the same. Sh well, no, 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 it's fine. No, we can, we, we can do that. So, no, we, yeah, we, yeah, we can, we can rearrange um, maybe over the weekend or, or something or, or next. Or, yeah. But we can find, yeah. we, we can coordinate another time. That's fine. It, yeah, it, it oh, is midnight God. anyway. Because there's so much to talk about too. Yeah. You know, I like to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I just they're, yeah. they're out of the other room there. I want to get them started. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Yeah, we we will uh, we will reschedule and uh, and then yeah finish it off. So that's fine. But you have some <laughs> good stuff because I know you didn't ask me about my. Five yeah, I was yeah, yeah I was gonna get the some of those other stuff, but you know, and then the nice little stories and stuff like that. Yeah, but, but now uh, we 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 will schedule. That's fine. Okay, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. so much, my brother. Thank you okay. so much. It's yes, right. sir. Okay. So you have a wonderful night, and I'm gonna go get these guys in here. Okay, that's fine. All right, see you soon.